Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Jeremy Taylor. The title of his new book, Not a Chimp, gives a clue as to what he has in his sights. Those who argue, and the group includes many eminent philosophers and primatologists, that the tiny difference between human and chimpanzee DNA means that they are our extremely close cousins in all important respects. But, Taylor argues in this book, much too much has been made of this degree of similarity. The idea that we are different from chimpanzees by as little as 1.6 and possibly even less in terms of our DNA is largely a fault of history. And it started really as much as 20 or more years ago when scientists started to compare. They couldn't compare in those days the DNA of chimps and humans or anything else because the technology wasn't available. But you could, uh, you could compare proteins, which are of course derived from DNA. And eventually they managed to be able to sequence very small areas of DNA inside genes and sort of just a few thousand uh, nucleotide bases of DNA. And from those very very early surveys, they concluded that the sequence difference between chimpanzees and humans was very, very small indeed. More recently, several larger surveys of the genome have apparently backed that up when they've been able to compare much larger stretches of DNA sequence, and again this magic number 1.6% crops up. But I believe that too much emphasis has been placed on it. There's a conundrum here. If we are virtually genetically identical, then we should appear to be, in terms of our morphology um, and our anatomy and our physiology and metabolism, very, very, very similar to chimpanzees. And we should be, in terms of our behaviour and cognition, very, very similar to chimpanzees. Some people think we are, but actually, in fact, when you look at it, there isn't one single bone in a human that's similar to that in a chimpanzee, and any decent anatomist can tell the two apart instantly. And those sorts of differences go into things like language, and uh, higher order mental functions and all the rest of it. We are very, very different animals. So you've got a, a, a real conundrum here. If we are genetically very similar, how is it that we actually have turned out to be really quite different in terms of two animal species? What do you think is at stake here? Because clearly throughout most of human history, we've thought of ourselves as very, very different from chimpanzees and the animal kingdom, you know, in, in terms of um, our history, this, this comparison is, you know, a blink of an eye. So what do, you think is, what do you think is at stake if we are indeed, as you believe, overemphasizing the similarities? History in all areas goes in cycles, and you're quite right. I mean, there was a time when it was completely proper to think of humans as cognitively unique animals in the animal kingdom, with a huge gulf in these parameters, if you like, between us and the rest of the primates and uh, lower vertebrates and so on. Over the last 20 years, it's almost become a dirty word to describe humans as cognitively unique, possibly because it's appeared to produce in some people's eyes a false dichotomy between us. In other words, we're not really part of the animal kingdom, we're not animals, and the rest of them are. And biologists have wanted to, to correct this plinth, if you like, on which we've put humanity. But I think what is happening now is that the fashion in science is changing again and people are beginning to understand that there are indeed these enormous yawning gulfs between us and chimpanzees. The danger of overemphasizing the similarity between us and chimpanzees, to my mind, not only represents an abuse of what the science is beginning to tell us, if only one would listen to it and try to understand it, but the danger is that we use this idea of almost complete similarity to push us into thinking that perhaps the difference between humans and chimpanzees is so little that actually they should be included in the same genus as us, Homo, and as a, a logical extension of that they should be accorded human rights. 
the better to save them. Because what's muddied the waters in the last sort of few years has been the, the, the growing realisation that just as chimpanzees are proving invaluable to us in our search to find what makes us human, they're dying out all over the place because, of course, we humans are uh, eroding their habitat and killing them off for bushmeat and all the rest of it. So they are disappearing as fast as they are becoming useful. And I think a number of scientists and a number of philosophers, for instance, the Great Ape Project, have decided that one of the best weapons to mobilise our empathy for chimpanzees is to try and get us to understand that they are virtually identical to us. And if they are virtually human beings, then perhaps we should accord them human rights and we should use that vehicle as a means to save them and to conserve them. Now, I think that that's not only an abuse of science, but I think it's just simply basically wrong. You don't have to identify with marshland plants or the white rhinoceros or any one of nature's endangered species in order to feel that actually it is morally reprehensible to drive this planet virtually to extinction, to drive uh, species diversity down. So why should we make a special case of chimps? For me, one of the most fascinating things in the book was when you broadened your field of vision beyond primates and humans to look at other species such as dogs and wolves and birds and look at what, they, what, what we can work out about their intelligence and their cognition. In the book, I mention one particular example of what I consider to be a really egregious folly. Uh, in, in reasoning. It happened to be to come up in a conversation with a primatologist called Franz de Waal, but basically his argument ran something like this. Chimpanzees and humans are 98.5% or more similar in their genes. Ergo, it is perfectly logical to argue that they must be 98.5% similar in their behaviour and their cognition. In other words, if you like, if in the old-fashioned idea of a scala natura or ladder of the animal kingdom, chimps are huffing up very close to our heels on this ladder and the other species are down below or haven't even hopped on the rungs of the ladder at all. If you broaden the number of species that you start to compare against each other over a wide range of sort of cognitive tests or tasks, if you like, you begin to realise just how much of a folly or a false picture this really is. So, for instance, if you take work with dogs, you find that on a number of tasks, for instance, where the dog has to watch a human giving cues, either by pointing or by turning his head or by gesturing towards or even by putting ambiguous cues like a marker in front of a, a cup that has food underneath it. Dogs are tremendously fast at accepting those human cues and unerringly uh, selecting the right cup with the food inside it. Chimpanzees can't do it. When you look at, um, at experiments with birds on a whole variety of, of tool-using tasks or cognitive tests to see how much they understand about the nature of tools, you find that they are every bit the equal of chimpanzees, possibly better over a whole load of these tests. And yet birds, I mean, we actually use the term bird brain to suggest a witless idiot. Uh, and yet here they are outperforming chimps over a battery of cognitive tests to do with tool use and the manipulation of tools to get food and so forth. So the wider you cast your net, you realise that actually cognition is not a function, strictly speaking, of how close taxonomically a species is to us. Yeah. Cognition is what cognition has to do. If there's a job to be done in the environment, evolution will forge a way to do it by forging some form of a cognitive mo module in the, in the mind of an animal species to do the job. This is, if you like, a kind of um, functional analogy to how we humans appear to do it. It may mean that the actual circuitry they use, the parts of the brain that they use, may be entirely different. But on the surface, they appear to be able to, to, to do what we do in a variety of ways, not across the cognitive board, but in specialised areas. And when you actually begin to realise just how adept crows, for instance, are at using tools and manipulating tools to get food, or dogs are in accepting human cues and engaging human attention to get their help, you find that the idea that chimpanzees must be 
better than all these species because they're closer to us taxonomically just completely evaporates and we begin to see cognition in a different way.